can influence. Um, how ancestry can influence cancer risk. Um, we know relatively less about how ancestry influences cancer outcomes once individuals um, develop cancer. And that's going to be the focus of the, of the work I'll be talking about. Um, and in particular, motivated by the fact that we now have um, quite a lot of data uh, that if used in a, in a somewhat clever way, um, can shed light on this question, I, I think, in, in, in a way that's um, quite innovative uh, and also um, uh, tractable and generalizable to a lot of different um, cancer settings. <clears throat> so uh, the structure of my talk is going to be first talking a little bit about the methods that we've developed to be able to use large scale um, uh, genomics data to uh, understand the influence of genetic ancestry. And then I'll talk about uh, two example sort of vignettes. One is about um, uh, some work, some research that we've been doing, trying to understand how ancestry influences tumor evolution and clinical outcomes. Um, and then a separate point, sort of thematically different point about how ancestry can actually be a technical confounder for diagnostics, um, specifically for tumor mutational burden. Um, so I hope this sort of provides um, both a methodological framework, but also kind of two different ways of thinking about how ancestry matters, both in understanding cancer biology and in essentially developing the, the right um, diagnostic tools for the right individuals. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, on the first point, and again, this gets back to the data motivation for this, uh, for this whole, um, uh, for all this research is, is that um, uh, uh, tumor panel sequencing, um, specifically the sequencing of typically several hundred known oncogenes um, for patients with cancer is now extremely common, maybe ubiquitous in some settings. It's um, very close to the standard of care for advanced disease at Dana-Farber. Um, there are uh, tens of thousands of sequenced tumors also collected as part of standard of care at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and this is growing um, uh, to and expanding to other um, cancer institutes. Uh, this is a paper in 2017, so quite a while ago, that presents an analysis of 100,000 um, sequence tumors from uh, that were done as part of the foundation medicine, um, sort of direct-to-consumer um, sequencing panel. So even five years ago, they had uh, 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 one of the largest um, data sets of uh, cancer genomics in existence. And this has obviously grown and skyrocketed in terms of sample size. Um, uh, again, I mentioned that a lot of tumor sequencing is happening at Dana-Farber. We have um, this effort called the Profile Project, which uh, sequences biopsies on a targeted panel called Oncopanel, which hits about 400 um, known cancer genes. Uh, these samples are all consented for research, um, and in particular, they are linked to electronic health records. So um, this potentially presents an opportunity to study very, very rich clinical outcomes at large, uh, at large scale. Um, <clears throat> my interest uh, and my background is primarily in germline genetics. So when I um, started my position at Dana-Farber and started thinking about this cohort, um, I had kind of one of these conversations where uh, I found out that a large number of tumors was being sequenced. And I said, uh, and match normal data, right, uh, along with those. And they were not sequencing match normal data um, along with those. And so the initial challenge was, how do we actually get back the germline genetic information um, that we're interested in from this otherwise extremely large, well curated and uh, richly phenotyped cohort. Um, and the way that we did that is uh, actually by borrowing from some work that had been going on in, um, uh, in the sort of in the field of GWAS in, and ideas that um, in fact, you can recover germline genetic information from very shallow coverage sequencing. Um, some of these uh, uh, papers you may recognize mention low pass sequencing, in some cases, extremely low coverage sequencing. Um, but the point being that 
actually, in order to infer common germline variation, you actually don't really need uh, uh, that much coverage. And in fact, you need a lot less coverage than, than you would expect. Um, and in fact, these targeted tumor panels, which are only, they're not exos, they're only covering about 400 genes, um, as we have shown, are sufficient to start getting this kind of common germline information um, out of them. And, and the way that this basically works in, in a cartoon is that we, um, when these tumors are sequenced, a very large number of reads goes into the targeted exons shown in blue is 100x or 1000x coverage in those exons to get really precise estimates of somatic variation. But then actually about half of the coverage, just because of the way that these platforms work, um, lands off target in the rest of the genome. Um, so, and that amounts to a coverage of about 0.1x or lower um, everywhere else. And it's more or less uniform throughout the, the rest of the genome. And the idea with this sort of ultra low coverage imputation is that um, <clears throat> what we want to know is the germline alleles in these individuals across the whole genome. What we really have by default is only what's going on in the targeted exons, um, but we can use haplotype reference panels, uh, of which there are now many, to infer these polymorphisms to sort of connect the high confidence calls in the exons and the very noisy low confidence calls from these one or two off-target reads. These actually provide us quite a lot of information. They tell us something about the alleles that these individuals are carrying, and then when we uh, integrate that across haplotype blocks in the reference panel, um, we can actually infer back the germline variation that was not directly sequenced. Um, we can also sort of resolve the, um, the variation that was, um, that, that did by chance get one or two reads um, off target. Uh, and so this is basically the approach is to use uh, the reads themselves to conduct the imputation by finding matches to the, um, to the haplotype reference panel. Uh, we have applied this imputation strategy to um, the 25,000 tumors that I mentioned. Of those, about 800 had germline SNP array data um, that we could benchmark on. This is a sort of cutting edge Illumina mega array, um, which was also imputed to the thousand genomes. Um, and when we compare the, the, the quality of the, of the variants that you get from the germline, versus this tumor off-targeted off -target imputation, um, we actually see a concordance that's surprisingly high given that we're basically pulling data that was otherwise discarded. Um, and after some very minimal quality control, um, the average correlation between the tumor imputed variant and the truth is uh, here, I think about 0.86 um, across the genome. Um, you can see the scale here goes down to 0.5, so we actually do not really see, um, especially after basic quality control, um, we don't really see major gaps um, throughout the genome. These, each, each of these dots represents, um, I believe, a window of, uh, of 100 common SNPs, um, and we see average imputation accuracy right around this 0.86 um, throughout the autosomes. <clears throat> so uh, by um, running this imputation, we can actually get the rest of the polygenic um, common variants with reasonable enough uh, accuracy to do interesting um, uh, research on them. Um, and in particular, one of the things in the focus of this talk is going to be using this off-target imputation to infer genetic ancestry. Um, so that's sort of the first thing, the, the first output that we wanted to uh, show that this kind of data could provide. Um, we did that again using the benchmark samples. We projected them into um, principal component space from the ground truth, from the germline SNPs, um, and from the tumor imputed variants. We didn't do any additional adjustment or anything. We just took the imputed data um, and projected it into PC space. And you can see that the concordance and the correlation um, between these uh, um, between these uh, ancestry components is extremely high. There's basically a correlation of 0.99 here. So even though individual SNP accuracy was about 0.86 on average, um, once you aggregate all of that across many markers that have different allele frequencies between populations, um, you get almost perfect ancestry recovery. Um, and what that looks like when we extend it to 
the rest of the cohort is something like this. This is sort of our old trusty um, principal component uh, plot. Now we're talking about patients from whom uh, tumors were sequenced. We have uh, African ancestry on the x-axis, uh, Asian ancestry on the y-axis, and then we've also included um, recorded or self-reported race for each of these individuals. And we can see that the components broadly match um, how individuals are being recorded in the EHR. Um, but also there's, a, a you know, as, as we well know, a large degree of variation um, across these components. So we, uh, this sort of passes the, 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 the sanity check in addition to the benchmarking here, but now gives us a quantitative estimate um, of ancestry, of continental ancestry across these individuals, um, which we can then incorporate into our analyses. Um, another way to look at it is as a percentage of ancestry um, within the individual uh, sort of uh, uh, recorded race groups. Um, and again, you can see, I'm not going to belabor this, but, but, but we see a great deal of diversity in individuals who are recorded as, um, as Asian, um, uh, containing various mixtures of Asian and, and European ancestry, as well as um, uh, some uh, African ancestry um, in a subset of these individuals. Um, individuals who are recorded as Black, again, have a wide range of European ancestry. Um, and actually, there are a number of individuals who are recorded as white, who probably either in error or who, because race does not map to ancestry, um, uh, actually have uh, uh, more than 10% non-European ancestry um, <clears throat> uh, inferred. So that's the that's sort of the tool that we're going to be using is ancestry inferred from these um, from these off-target reads, and then the applications that I'm going to talk about, um, the first of which is this analysis of how does ancestry now change the way we think about um, somatic uh, uh, alterations and, um, and patient outcomes. Um, the basic questions that we want to answer uh, is that while we know that cancer subtypes, sort of broad classes of um, uh, of, of cancer definitions, um, some of which are defined by the, the, by the tumor pathology or by the drivers in that tumor, um, can differ across populations, both across ancestry groups and, and by race. Um, and what we sought to answer here was to what extent is ancestry associated with individual somatic alterations? Now that we have ancestry data and we have the tumor sequencing, which tells us about the alterations in the tumor, um, we can ask how strongly these two classes of features are correlated with each other. Um, and then in particular, does this ancestry association influence the, um, uh, the, the, the downstream patient outcomes? So the first question, uh, just to visualize this a little bit, is we're looking at ancestry and we want to know whether individuals who are at one end of this ancestry spectrum tend to have more driver mutations of a certain kind um, than individuals who are at the other end of the ancestry spectrum. Um, and the other question is for individuals who do carry a driver, um, do individuals at one end of the ancestry spectrum have a different outcome trajectory? And this, this is like a really simplified Kaplan-Meier plot of survival um, for the carriers of the driver um, uh, uh, with high ancestry, non-European ancestry in this case versus those with lower non-European ancestry. And this starts to sort of give us an understanding of how much of a role um, does ancestry play in the tumor and in the outcome. Um, so focusing on that first question, this is a cartoon, but this actually reflects an, a very well-established association between East Asian ancestry um, and uh, EGFR mutation status in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And so we confirmed that in our data, we had about 4,000 individuals <coughs> um, with lung cancer. Uh, and we see a very clear and striking relationship between uh, the inferred Asian ancestry down here um, and uh, on the x-axis, sorry, um, and 
the sort of uh, carrier EGFR mutation carrier frequency. And it's really, I mean, this is, I, I don't know, I was shocked by how much of a difference it is, but we're talking about individuals who are sort of at the tail end of, of the European ancestry group have, uh, uh, I think, a 17% EGFR mutation carrier rate um, and individuals who are at the tail end of the East Asian ancestry group have over a 75% EGFR mutation carrier rate. So this is a huge difference in how, uh, in what driver these tumors develop as a function of genetic ancestry. Um, and in this case, we actually really do see it through the full spectrum of admixture. So I won't really get into the sort of admixture and local ancestry aspects of this because the, the methodology there is more complicated. Um, but when we look at individuals who are self-identifying as white but have East Asian ancestry, they have more EGFR mutations. And when we look at individuals in this middle group who are sort of admixed, um, also as a proportion of their admixture, they have more EGFR mutations. So this actually looks like it is more strongly connected to ancestry than either a dichotomization of ancestry or, uh, or to predefined racial groups. Um, and we also saw this uh, not as striking, but the similar effect for KEEP1 mutations in lung cancer, which was also recently shown in a, in a paper in, in Nature Genetics that investigated an Asian cohort and compared it to Europeans in TCGA, showing much lower rates of KEEP1 mutations in East Asia. And so this can sort of um, uh, this relationship obviously can go either way. Uh, so this was a positive set of positive controls, and now we expanded this analysis to five common cancers, the most common cancers that we had in our data set, um, each of which had more than a thousand um, sequenced individuals for which we got ancestry. Um, and we see these are um, QQ plots of the association between ancestry and each somatic alteration tested. Um, I guess I'm glossing over a little bit about how we actually define these, but we basically just take them from the clinical pipeline that gets reported to physicians, and we tested either somatic um, SNVs in a given gene as one type of phenotype or um, any kind of copy number in a given gene as another type of phenotype. So each gene gets tested um, uh, twice for uh, linear association with genetic ancestry in each of these five cancer types. Um, and uh, again, we can see that like for lung cancer, EGFR mutations are hugely significantly associated. This is a p-value of 10 to the negative 30, I think, but there's a large number of other uh, alterations that are significantly associated with ancestry. And this tends to be the case for, um, uh, for other cancers. Um, as well. Um, I think almost all of these, except for ovarian cancer, where we're really underpowered, there's a relatively small number of non-Europeans um, had some somatic uh, uh, mutation um, associated with ancestry. Um, and I'll get to this sort of TMB association later on. So the first question is, does ancestry influence uh, or correlate with what we see um, in terms of alterations in the tumor, and that is a definitive yes, both in terms of what was previously known in the literature, we can continuing to see that um, in the clinic, but also in terms of novel uh, alterations associated with ancestry um, in these other cancer types. Um, I think to some extent, uh, or I, I would argue a more critical question is beyond just telling us that there are sort of potentially different subtypes, but in different populations, um, does ancestry actually change what these drivers mean in terms of their effect or association to, um, to patient outcomes? Um, and so that gets us back to this question for individuals who are carriers of a given somatic mutation, whether it's enriched in one ancestry or not, um, does ancestry modify the effect that this, uh, the association that this variant um, has with survival? Um, and so, we investigated that through fairly conventional um, survival modeling through Cox proportional hazards models. Um, in particular, we had overall survival defined for these individuals and in that survival was linked to the national death registry. Um, so we had pretty uh, robust um, information on, um, on survival for every single individual here. Um, and uh, conventionally, the way that you would identify uh, prognostic uh, biomarker, or I don't know if biomarker is the right 
word here, but a prognostic association with a somatic alteration would be simply by testing survival as an endpoint, um, diagnosis, or, uh, uh, or treatment at Dana-Farber, or sequencing as the start point, um, censoring for loss to follow up, or if the, um, if the patient's not in the death registry, um, and then uh, testing for the carrier status of the somatic mutation as the, um, <clears throat> as the independent variable. Uh, now, what we're interested in is the modifying effect of ancestry, and so we extend this model to include ancestry uh, uh, components as a, as a quantitative score, essentially pr proportion of ancestry from a given population um, as one feature in this model, the somatic mutation is still in there, and then we're looking for an interaction between ancestry and mutational status um, as it influences overall survival. Um, and you can think of this as uh, individuals of one ancestry have a different hazard ratio for this mutation than individuals of another ancestry, um, or the, I think you can flip it around um, and say that carriers of the mutation have a different survival profile depending on ancestry. So there's sort of two interpretations of this interaction score, um, of the effect size on this interaction, but um, I, I think it's a little bit easier to think of it as differences in the prognostic effect, the hazard ratio um, of this mutation as a function of ancestry. That's what we're testing for and we're controlling for ancestry and mutation status as a fixed effect. Um, so just backing up a little bit, first of all, does ancestry itself, uh, ignore the interaction term, um, have an association with survival? And it does, but it's actually fairly small in this cohort. So this is the result of the African ancestry PC um, on top <clears throat> for association with survival. You can see that there's a fairly significant P of 0.052. Uh, hazard ratio of 1.2 association of ancestry. Um, it, uh, so sort of African ancestry um, is associated with slightly worse survival. And this is primarily driven by breast cancer um, in this cohort. That's the only cancer type where individually we see a significant effect. Um, when we looked at Asian ancestry, it's the other way around. So East Asian ancestry is associated with slightly improved survival, a hazard ratio of about 0.7. Um, this one is more significant, but again, this is actually largely um, driven by a single cancer type, which is um, non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this is a little bit complicated uh, and it gets back to that point about EGFR mutations. EGFR is much more common in individuals with East Asian ancestry and EGFR is a targetable driver. Um, so there's probably a treatment effect that explains this. Um, this association. But this was just mostly a bird's eye view of understanding whether ancestry has an effect on the overall survival um, patterns. And it, again, in this data, the effect is, um, is, uh, uh, is there, but is just nominally significant. Um, but now we extend this model to test um, individual uh, uh, ancestry somatic mutation um, interactions. And uh, it, we, when we ran this across all of the um, somatic uh, alterations that we had um, in these cancer types, we actually found a very large number of, uh, of these interaction um, events. And the, those interactions look sort of like this. Here's a couple of examples of individual associations. So um, just to give you a sense of what this means, um, uh, and in order to show these as Kaplan-Meier plots, we've had to dichotomize the ancestry, but actually, of course, we're always working with quantitative ancestry as our feature. Um, you can see, <clears throat> in this case, an interaction in glioma with copy number in the PRDM1 gene, where individuals who, have, who carry a copy number alteration in PRDM1 have approximately similar survival curves, maybe slightly worse survival, um, for individuals with African ancestry. But on the other hand, individuals who do not carry an alteration of PRDM1 um, actually have substantially improved survival uh, if they have African ancestry relative to European. So this is an example where ancestry in some sense flips the direction um, of, the, um, of the effect of being a PRDM1 um, copy number carrier. Um, and we see something, 
uh, another example in the opposite direction where in ovarian cancer, individuals who have copy number alterations at the RHEB gene, um, uh, the uh, survival is much worse for individuals with African ancestry relative to Europeans. Um, but for individuals who are wild type, who don't have this copy number alteration, actually survival is um, quite similar. Um, and I have a warning here that these are Kaplan-Meier plots. So there's a lot of covariates that need to be accounted for that these do not account for. But again, this is just to give you a sense of how substantial these shifts um, of ancestry can be. And they potentially change our interpretation of what it means to be a PRDM1 carrier and you know, maybe have implications for what um, these alterations are actually doing in the context of different, um, of different populations. Yeah, do you have a question, Linda? Uh, yeah, hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, question about glioma. So for glioma, I think there's some mutations that are really important in terms of delineating these very well-established glioma subtypes, so like IDH mutations, for example, um, 1P19Q um, code lesions. So I guess I was wondering if you saw any ancestry interactions with those features and if the PRDM1 signal is maybe sort of tagging a different um, sort of established marker of glioma subtypes? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, that would be actually my hypothesis is, is a lot of these big effects are probably tagging some established subtypes. The, the cancer subtype data that we have is not um, great uh, on these patients. Um, we did see associations between ancestry um, and cancer subtype. I don't remember if this, this PRDM1 example specifically uh, uh, is accounted for by that. But I know that when we, we sort of reran the analysis, including the more detailed cancer type information that we do have, there were still a lot of interactions that remained after, um, after adjusting for that. So it's not, it's not all of the effect, but I, I think that that's probably, um, I think it does have an effect for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting if this was something that was really ancestry specific because for glioma too, I think the incidence is actually lower yeah. Um, and, and African Americans. So, uh, I mean, I would maybe suggest stratifying this by IDH status at least, right. and then seeing if this um, sort of tracks with that. Uh, yeah, or I think that's right. Mutations too. I yeah, think. yeah, that's a great idea. I think we, I think we should definitely start. I mean, this is something that sort of we came around to after a while is is incorporating the the more detailed cancer types here. But I, I think it's definitely, and that's kind of I, I that's the way that I think about what this is. But this analysis is potentially identifying is either existing cancer subtypes that differ by populations or you know possibly identifying novel ones and so this the conditioning that you're proposing is really relevant um i i have a question it yeah looks like there you know there's a lot of um uncertainty in the graph on the left um so could it be that just like uh you have very few african yeah. ancestry uh, altered um, individuals with glioma in there. And basically the left is just like, you didn't have enough information and then the right is more of what you would see. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think we should definitely, that's why I'm sort of hedging about whether this is different or whether it's that this is clearly significantly different. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, I think these, these sort of, um, it's a little bit hard to, um, uh, to think about these like, longitudinal confidence intervals, but certainly we can look at the hazard ratio in this group and, the ha and that will have an uncertainty estimate and the hazard ratio in this group. What the interaction term is telling us is that that difference of hazard ratios is significant, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that both of the hazard ratios themselves are significant. So yeah, I agree. We should like definitely keep in mind the confidence intervals here. And, and sure. the other question I had is I, I know nothing about glioma, but um, if there, these are like in directly on or un, un not directly related to targeted treatments or um, um, would differential access to treatment or differential compliance mm -hmm. like the major explanation for? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I mean, so I, I'll sort of touch on that with the with the caveats at the end that we're not accounting for um, treatment history here, which is definitely going to skew. And I think that like we see that in the in the case of the EGFR um, uh, mutations for sure, where there's sort of the targeted treatment is very clear. Um, 
but I, yeah, I don't think that we should be interpreting these uh, associations in in uh, in any way as as causal um, without uh, uh, taking into consideration both the treatments that the patients are getting, um, the access that they had to mm -hmm. healthcare, and why they came to Dana Farber, which is not a you know which is a tertiary cancer center. And so um, by the time that they sort of enter this study, there's already been quite a lot of ascertainment that could potentially skew um, uh, what type of cancer they have. I, I have just a quick uh, comment. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so I was just wondering if, um, you know, when you present these survival plots, if you could also put in the risk tables, because it would help mm -hmm. us to see the numbers that are associated with each group. And you yep. clearly have, um, it seems like a few, a small amount of people in the African ancestry group. Yeah. Um, in all cases, but it'd be helpful to see the numbers. Yeah. And um, so the issue with um, accounting for all your possible confounders, particularly the access to care, did you see, did you say that was part of your plan? Because I'd be very interested to figure out how you all are going to do that. It, it always ends up being very complicated. Yeah, I agree. No, I think that, I mean, I, so I, maybe I'll, I'll just go right to this slide of caveats. So uh, it's not, these are uh, uh, confounders that we did not account for here in this initial yeah. analysis, which is really just a scan. Um, but I think that we, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually open to, uh, to suggestions for how, whether it would make sense to try to account for it in this data, um, or whether, you know, if we start going down that path, there is no um, uh, robust way to account for access. And so maybe it's not, um, it, you know, then it, we wouldn't really be able to get to a clear finding. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing I'll mention that we've looked at, which is a little bit hacky, but we do have um, zip code information um, on these patients. And so we've tried incorporating um, geocoded socioeconomic status and um, various, for lung cancer, various measures of pollution. Um, we actually see that those uh, effects have uh, those, even just at the zip code level, um, effects have a very strong association with survival. Um, so there's definitely a lot of heterogeneity here that's coming just through um, SES and, um, and exposures. Um, again, I'm not, I sort of didn't present it here because we, that's also a, a, a fairly messy analysis and I don't want it to um, seem like we're uh, again, trying to use that to draw causal statements, but that's one way we've thought about mm -hmm. trying to answer that question. Um, do you, do from the electronic data record, you probably have, uh, you know, the type of treatment the patients receive. So you could match on mutation and treatment by, uh, you know, for uh, the ancestry comparison and then look only for those who had the treatment that you're supposed to get with that mutation. But that would depend on his numbers, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does, right. It, it all comes down to, I mean, maybe for some of the more common cancers, that's something we could do. I think it's a great idea. It, it gets practically a bit complicated because a lot of patients are getting a mixture of treatments. Again, most of this, by virtue of being at Dana-Farber and having been biopsied, um, are fairly advanced cancers. Um, and so they've both had a complicated treatment history before the biopsy, and they're having a complicated treatment history here. Um, so I think it ends up being a, a, a fairly challenging to do this kind of matching or to try to include covariates for, um, uh, for, uh, for the, to then fully capture the treatments. Um, the, you know, the other challenge here is that we oftentimes don't know what treatments they received prior to, um, coming to Dana-Farber. So without more detailed chart review, um, we would only have a limited history too. Can I also bother about, I it called my attention, the survival uh, analysis before you included yeah. the interaction. And um, I don't know if I misunderstood, but for, um, it looked like for breast, you said it's worse in the European ancestry 
Uh, no, sorry. So the these are so the African ancestry is associated with worse with a higher hazard ratio. Okay. Yeah, I thought you said the opposite, and I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> No, sorry, no, 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 yeah. So it's a little bit confusing because here we're showing the log hazard ratio, but um, yeah, the, the hazard ratio itself is one. Point two one. Is, uh, is that survival is worse in the African ancestry. Exactly, okay. yeah. That's yep. consistent. Okay, um, so this is now zooming out from, so what I showed previously is now a single point in um, in this uh, volcano plot and showing there's actually a very large number of um, at a 5% FDR um, significant interactions between ancestry um, and various somatic alterations. Um, so uh, this is fairly widespread and uh, the the other the sort of the, the media question that we started thinking about was um, to what extent do these um, do these sort of ancestry interactions um, influence the overall um, prognostic effect for a given individual? So um, I think previously this was like, do we see ancestry influence somatic events at all? But now we wanted to quantify how much um, all uh, somatic alterations are modified by um, ancestry in these individuals. Um, and essentially what we did was we expanded the previous interaction model that I described to now be a, a multivariate penalized model. So instead of a single mutation here, we're including a matrix of all of the somatic features for those individuals. And instead of one interaction, we have all of the interactions between ancestry and somatic alterations. And this is a there's a large number of degrees of freedom here. So we apply a lasso penalization to um, uh, to shrink the effects, uh, the non-significant effects to zero. Um, and then we evaluate, we're, now we're interested in overall prediction rather than in individual features. And we evaluate that overall prediction by cross-validation in this data. So everything that I'm gonna be showing is a cross-validated um, sort of prediction and held out data um, from a model trained in this way. Um, and what we see is that uh, when we build a predictor using just genetic features, so just the mute matrix part of the model here, um, we see a highly statistically significant association, uh, pan cancer, um, primarily driven by lung cancer and glioma, um, uh, with a hazard ratio of 1.7 in all individuals. So this is a single predictor using all somatic features, um, is very significantly associated with survival. Um, but then when we additionally look at the predictor, predictor from the um, ancestry interactions, uh, we see that the that predictor, so this part over here, um, is also significantly associated with survival um, in held out data, um, and at a comparable hazard ratio, hazard ratio of 1.5 for the interaction term versus 1.7 for the for the genetic feature term. So this interaction is now. Um, uh, essentially um, capturing signal from the non-European set of individuals here. So that's a smaller fraction of the a minority of the population and therefore the p-value is much less significant. Um, but in terms of absolute effect, the modification provided by ancestry is sort of on a comparable scale to um, uh, the, uh, the prognostic effect that you get from all genetic features um, uh, together in the population. Um, and then, you know, another way that we could think about that is, is, uh, is sort of trying to quantify how much for any individual, um, how much is their prognosis modified um, if we use this model on the left from all genetic features, or if we use this model on the right that also includes ancestry interactions. Um, and so that's plotted here is the uh, uh, as a function of the absolute change in your in a patient predicted survival, how many patients have uh, uh, predicted survival change of that much um, across different cancer types? Um, I would just focus on maybe the black line here as the as the pin cancer result. Um, but what we see is that um, uh, if we sort of set an arbitrary point at uh, you know does your prognosis change by more than six months um, by after we incorporate the ancestry interactions and we see that between 10 and 30 percent of uh, patients with non-European ancestry 
um, have an adjustment of more than six months from this prognostic model. Um, so the uh, the contribution, both the, the sort of hazard ratio of this interaction model um, and the uh, amount of the fraction of individuals for which it has a fairly meaningful influence is pretty high. Uh, so just to conclude this section, uh, which I guess covered a, a number of different topics. First, the point that we can, just the very basic point that we can use targeted um, tumor panel sequencing to infer genetic ancestry using off-target imputations. That's sort of the workhorse of these analyses. Um, then in this data, we see many significant associations between genetic ancestry and somatic alterations. Um, and we see also a qualitatively large um, um, uh, interaction effect of ancestry on the prognostic, uh, the, the hazard ratios of, um, of these somatic events. Um, and in particular, and I think as, as has now been appreciated for germline predictive models where um, uh, it's extremely important to have data from non-European populations that those predictive risk models are trained in, um, we're seeing something similar for somatic prognostic models that if we want to integrate many somatic features together to make a, a survival prediction for a patient, um, we should also be accounting for um, ancestry in those individuals. Again, it, either it's, uh, uh, it's very likely to be a surrogate for other factors here, um, but it does change the, um, the prediction that we would make for those patients. Um, and uh, I already, sort of covered this slide a little bit, but um, of course, there's a lot of caveats in these analyses. We, we tried to account for um, very broad clinical variables that we had available to us, but in particular, the treatment heterogeneity and the lead time bias um, are, uh, are, are serious confounders here. So um, again, I, I think we need to use these associations as um, interesting hypotheses to then follow up in a more careful uh, uh, and sort of more richly collected uh, or uh, or rigorously ascertained cohort, or if, we, if we actually want to get to the to the, the causal association here. Um, and I'll just mention that the uh, you know in particular the points about how ancestry is not just a map of race and. Um, in some instances can differ quite substantially from race. Um, I, I thought was covered beautifully in this um, uh, paper in the New England Journal last year. And, and, and sort of, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, just, well, just wanted to highlight, this is, this is something that we, we have read in great detail and that I encourage folks who are working in this, on this topic to, to, re to read um, often. Okay, so that, um, the first example, was about incorporating um, genetic ancestry into thinking about um, biological patterns of tumor evolution and patient outcome. Um, the second example, which I'll try to go through quickly, is a little bit more straightforward, and it is more about how ancestry can influence the technical performance of, um, of, of specific uh, uh, clinical diagnostics. Um, and, and in particular, focusing on um, tumor mutational burden and uh, um, um, uh, uh, in the case of immunotherapy. So, uh, and I'll, yeah, I'll try to summarize this, uh, just a couple of slides here. Um, so tumor mutational burden, basically the estimate of the total somatic mutations in the tumor or TMBs is now an FDA approved biomarker for um, immunotherapy. and uh, there are many, and in particular, high TMB um, is, uh, um, is indicated for uh, better response to immunotherapy. Um, and there's now a very large number of platforms from which individuals or physicians can estimate TMB um, to determine immunotherapy for their, um, for their patients, including some tumor-only estimates. And so um, the observation that we made is that um, uh, these tumor-only estimates of TMB may be particularly susceptible to um, biases to different um, uh, uh, patient ancestries. Um, and specifically, uh, let me just get into that more detail here, it, it sort of gets down to what do we consider a somatic variant when we look at um, panel sequencing. When we're talking about tumor normal sequencing, um, 
a somatic mutation is essentially the variant that we saw in the tumor minus the mutations that we saw in the germline. So there's a clear um, definition here. Now, there's some complexities from um, CHIP, for example, but broadly speaking, this is how we estimate somatic calls and then we integrate them all into to get TMB. Um, when we look at tumor only sequencing, we don't have that much normal as the back end. And so instead what's typically done is estimating the mutations in the tumor and then subtracting mutations from an external reference panel of germline sequencing. Um, and so you can see that this is where the problem comes in that for individuals, um, uh, depending on the population that these uh, estimates are being made in, that reference panel is going to have a much larger amount of data or much smaller amount of data. And in particular um, for the uh, NOMAD reference panel, there's about six times more Europeans than non-Europeans um, in the study. So this filtering is very, very different for European individuals versus non-European individuals. Um, and that's kind of the, the main point here is that, uh, is that the ancestry um, defines how well the, uh, the filtering from tumor-only sequencing can be done. Um, I'll skip over the example that we have from real data. I think it's clear enough how this should be presenting itself. Um, we looked at uh, this phenomenon in TCGA data and we basically simulated um, so in the TCGA, there's tumor normal whole exome sequencing available that we can use to detect true TMB. Um, we simulated as if we had done a tumor panel sequencing, um, and then we applied NOMAD as the reference panel for filtering out somatic mutations. So this gives us like a tumor only pseudo TMB. Um, and then we looked at how that uh, TMB inferred from the tumor differs by ancestry relative to the truth, um, and we defined um, recalibration criteria um, based on these differences to basically try to correct the TMB estimate um, based on the individual's global ancestry. Um, when we do that, uh, we see that in uh, uh, a set of high, previously tumor classified high TMB um, tumors uh, broken out by, um, by genetic ancestry, we see the misclassification rate is there is some misclassification in the Europeans just because the tumor only estimate is going to be upwardsly biased, um, but there's a much higher, a 1.5 to 2x higher misclassification in non-Europeans because the reference panels are not as good. Um, and so a lot of these individuals are in truth, if we had the match normal, they would not be TMB high, um, but are being called TMB high um, from the panel. And this then, of course, because it's a biomarker, um, an approved biomarker actually has an impact on, um, on the treatment decisions that are made for these patients. Um, and in particular, we wanted to explore that question of, of what impact this TMB misclassification could have on outcomes. Um, so we looked at a cohort of 1,600 patients on immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are actually being treated with immunotherapy um, at Dana-Farber, for whom, again, we have overall survival data. Um, <clears throat> And in this cohort, we see that individuals who have uh, uh, a corrected estimate using our method of uh, high TMB have better overall survival, uh, significantly better overall survival as is expected and as has been shown in clinical trials. Um, but for individuals who were thought to have a high uh, TMB, but actually were corrected to have a low TMB because of this tumor-only inflation, um, their survival trajectories are very similar to those individuals or not significantly different um, from those individuals who, uh, who were thought to have a low TMB prior to the correction. So this blue group would have been um, uh, recommended for, potentially recommended for immunotherapy based on high TMB, but actually does not have outcomes that are um, uh, substantially better compared to the true high TMB group. Um, and again, this sort of miscalibration is going to differ as a function of ancestry because it's primarily uh, biased uh, due, to the, to, due to the germline reference panels and not like anything that's, um, that's actually observed in the tumor itself. Um, so just to conclude this section, uh, uh, I, I think this is, uh, you know, the, the, the goal is to provide an, an, a different way in which ancestry, example of a different way in which ancestry um, can affect uh, 
uh, how we think about cancer outcomes. Um, and in, in this case, the uh, uh, ancestry and the lack of representative reference panels uh, biases the way that um, a, a biomarker um, is inferred. And what that ends up uh, translating into is that some individuals are going to get um, suboptimal treatment recommendations uh, mm -hmm. because of these biases. Um, in this case, it means that non-Europeans are maybe over-recommended for immunotherapy. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the downstream consequences of that um, are, are, are debatable, but it certainly has an effect. Um, and with that, just want to thank all of the folks who, um, the trainees who led the work and, and our collaborators. And, uh, thank you for your questions. I'm happy to discuss more.